Hello and welcome uh, to ISIL Hack. I hope this event brings you um, all an opportunity to learn and grow as we all face these uncertain times together. And I, for one, am excited to be able to hear from the many great speakers throughout today. Uh, now, before we begin, I just have some housekeeping matters that I would like to attend to. Uh, Firstly, in Australia, before major public gatherings, we try to do an acknowledgement of country. And while there isn't an equivalent for worldwide gatherings, I would still like to do one. So I would like to acknowledge the Wangal people of the Eora Nation. It is on their ancestral land that we broadcast from today. I would like to pay my respect to elders past and present. And in recognition that this is a global event, I would like to extend that respect to all indigenous elders and communities around the globe and any members of those communities who may be in attendance today. Now on to actual conference housekeeping. Uh, if you've registered for either of the tutorials in the analytics power hour, please check your emails. There'll be details regarding how to access that session and what materials you will be needing to have downloaded onto your device. Uh, additionally, if you have registered for both and haven't been in contact with me, please let me know which one you plan to attend live as I would love to make those spaces available for others. Uh, next, each speaker will have a question time towards the end of their talk. So if you have any questions, uh, please either note them in the YouTube uh, chat by kind of flagging it in some way that I'll be able to find or by using the ISOL hack hashtag on Twitter. I'm going to be doing my best to try and stay on top of them. Uh, but if I miss it, I, I apologize in advance. And lastly, if you are planning on attending social hour trivia tonight, um, we're asking for teams of four people maximum, um, but if you would like to have uh, a randomly assigned team, uh, you have until the end of this morning's session to register using the link that's in the description. Uh, now with that out of the way, uh, grab a cup of coffee, get comfortable as our first speaker uh, will be starting at 9 a.m. on the dot. Thank you.
kind of stuff that turned out pretty useful when I started to do this uh, hockey stat stuff. So by night, I'm tracking hockey games and doing analytics. And so even though I moved to Montreal, uh, I was still working on European hockey, and especially French hockey for the past few years. And so some of my friends back in France are asking me, well, you now live in the greatest city, uh, greatest hockey city and a first city on earth, why the hell do you spend your evening tracking French hockey? And that's a very fair question. And the honest, simple answer is that, well, it's because nobody's tracking data there. And so two years ago, I wanted to start something new. And basically in France, the league is just providing goals and assists, plus minus and face-offs. So yeah, in the spring of 2018, I started this uh, Magnus Corsi initiative and all the data and presentation is based on this. So it was me and my friend Mathieu Brosso and a bunch of volunteers, awesome group, group of people that we hired. Uh, we decided to track by hand all the games that happened since and even some that happened before. 
So that's over 603 games and over 74,000 shots that we tracked by hand and thousands and thousands of zone entries, zone exits, etc. So I just want to say I'm so very proud and happy with what we did and it's not bragging, it's just that honestly I thought that would interest like 10 people and in the end we are we have maybe 1,500 people just on Twitter and all the teams know us and all the media knows us. We provide these stats for French TV and the official provider, the broadcaster. I mean, we had um, dozens of chats with coaches there that were pretty happy to have that resources at hand. And even openly, like, came to us and saying, I don't know anything about analytics. You know, I would have tons of questions for you. We just, they were just happy to chat and we were happy to help. So, awesome experience and all doors open in the world of pro hockey so you never know so today i wanted to talk about sequences and maybe some of you have read the article that was published on hockeyref.com um, about a few weeks ago and in this transition you will also see the second article that will be up uh, hopefully sometime next week so what's a sequence it's pretty intuitive but roughly yeah that's every time the puck changes position so that gives about 250 sequences in one game, okay? It's a bit more complicated than that, but I'll get back to it. But roughly, that's it. So why did I want to do that? I just wanted to be able to link events together inside one sequence, and I wanted to be able to link sequences between themselves, you know, to look at the causes and consequences of events. If I do this, what happened? If I do that, what happened, etc. So just a quick... Um, parentheses for those of you that enjoy losing high sights, uh, staring at the screen, tracking hockey games, how do you track sequences? Well, if you uh, attend any one on one tracking courses, you know that you have to make your life as easy as possible. So I just um, set up my tracking tool, I'm using Excel, to automatically recognize when sequence, meaning the previous one, ended. So basically, you start a new sequence after a goal is scored when uh, there's a new period, when the situation changes from like 5-on-5 five five to power play. Uh, if the other team reports any kind of event, meaning they got put back enough to track something, or if your team tries again, again, to exit the defensive zone or enter the offensive zone. And so, I put a little example on the right, you see like sequence 19, uh, it starts with a pass exit, XP, then you have a control entry, EC, then you have a fail, high danger pass, PF. But even if you fail, the next event is, of course, C4, CF. And it ends there. Sequence 19. And it ends because the next event is a uh, fail dump exit against XDFA. So the other team got the bug back and it tried to dump it out. But as you can see, the next event is again a fail dump exit against, meaning the other team, they failed the first time, they tried again. And as you have to try again, I consider you start from scratch, so it's a new sequence. So it's a bit more than just every time the puck switches position, it's more every time there's a new attack. Because if you have to go back and try again, I, yeah, I consider you're uh, back to square one and you try again, so new sequence. So what's included in a sequence? So far, the basic stuff, you know, zone exit, entries, high danger passes, shot attempts, and shot assist. So as of last month, I had like 110,000 events in my database. I honestly have no idea how many sequence that is because as you just saw, one sequence can be just one tail dump. But what I know is that I have over 16,000 sequences that included a shot. And that's where it gets interesting, of course. So for instance, I have over 3,000 sequences, including a shot and a successful carry exit. And we're gonna get to that. So finally, I had to give a value to sequences. And obviously if there is no shot in a sequence, the sequence has no value, it's zero. If there is one or multiple shots, I just sum all the shots expected goals value to get the total. So I just put a little example there, and you have a sequence with two shots, one high danger shot that is worth 0.23 expected goals, and you have a point shot that is 0.01. So my sequence total value will be 0.23 plus 0.01, 0.24 expected goals. So what now? 
the first thing I did was to calculate the average expecting goals created for each event when it leads to a shot. So I did the math and it gives the data you can see there. And okay, first one is successful high energy passes, makes sense. But then the second one is a failed dump exit. So a failed dump exit creates on average more expecting goals than a control entry. And it was like, what the, in French, obviously, but makes no sense, okay? And then I paused for like two minutes and I thought, yeah, but when it leads to a shot, how often a failed dump exit leads to a shot? So the next step was to calculate what I call the halving rate, which is basically how often an event leads to a shot. So for example, I have over 14,000 successful control entries in my database and 8,400 of them led to a shot. So you do the math and it gives you 60%. So 60% of successful control entries led to a shot. So the most dangerous event is still the high, successful high danger passes, leads to a shot 89% of the time, okay? Then you have control entry, 60%. And then you can go down the list to the very bottom and then you have failed dump exit at just 3% of the time. And it makes more sense. So the final step was to put everything together in what I call the potential value of events. So to calculate that, you just take the average expecting goals created and the chance of it happening, the happening rate. And so for my carry exit, for instance, the average expecting goals created is 0.062, and it leads to a shot 36% of the time. So my potential value for a successful carry exit, I could expect that it will bring me 0.022 expecting goals on average every time. And if I do this for my failed dump exit that had, you remember, the very high average expected goals created at 0.077, but it leads to a shot just 3% of the time. So if you do the math, it gives you 0.003 expected goals, which is basically nothing and the lowest of all events. And it makes sense. So in the end, I put all of those together in what I call the hockey decision tree. So basically, it maps out every event I have and every outcomes you could face on average. So if I, I am in my defensive zone and I want to exit the puck and I decide to carry it, you know, possession. So the potential value that I face is 0.020 expected goal. And I'm just, I'm just going to skip the decimal to agree. If I succeed, I go up from 20 to 22. Okay, if I fail, I'm down to 003, which is basically nothing, and probably most of the time I just lost the puck. But I succeeded. Okay. And now I'm facing the zone entry. And so if I decide to try to enter in control, my potential value goes up from 22 to 32. But if I decide to dump it in, it goes down from 22 to 11, and I just lost half my potential. So let's say I decided to enter in control because I'm a good boy and I succeed. So I go up from 32 to 39. If I fail, I go all the way back down to 005. If I had decided to dump it in um, and I retrieve the puck, I'm like one of the first two players to retrieve the puck. I go back up from 11 to 24, which is roughly the way I was back in the neutrals. So even if I had the puck in the offensive zone after a dump in, I mean, basically no better shape than I was back in the neutral zone. That tells you something. So I can try to, to do a high entry pass, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, when I envisioned this, I thought it would be useful. And when I showed it to hockey coaches um, this year, in the past few months, they all told me the same thing, which is this is great because it puts numbers where we had assumptions before. And I mean, for decades, they worked on based on common knowledge, and everybody knew already that a successful entry is more dangerous than a dump in. But now we statistically know how much more dangerous it is. And they told me the coaches that they could show this to their players to train them to be smarter on the ice, to make better informed decision, not just you know rinse and repeat everything they learn uh, since their childhood. And so they told me a player should have a little alarm in his brain when he's crossing the neutral zone and he's facing a choice between try to enter in control or just safely dumping in. 
And in this brain, there should be something that tells him, okay, if you decide to dump in, you're just losing half your potential, you know, that kind of stuff. So obviously there's a lot of circumstances, circumstances and context in every other game that these all these are averages, you know, hundreds of games. And recently I just dumped in a hundred games from the Swiss Hockey League, Elite Hockey League, so like the fourth or fifth best league in the world, and the numbers did not move. So I'm not insulting everybody in saying the French is not an elite league. That's just the reality. But when I compare to an elite league, the things did not move. So maybe we're on a big guy, so maybe it would change a bit in the NHL, for instance, but I think those numbers were uh, actually pretty stable uh, across the globe. So how do you use it? So far, the numbers I just show you, I mean, we can use it for research and think about the game of hockey in general, but honestly, when I started to think about those sequences, I just wanted to use them on a daily basis um, when I'm working for a team. So I'm just gonna show quickly how I use it. So this is part of a game report, and you can see all the sequences in that game that led to a shot. And so sometimes it's messy, but sometimes it's pretty clear you had more success going through the left side of the ice or the right side of the ice, or just using pass exit or carry exit, using rush, etc. And obviously, the good thing is to have that list of sequence on the right side of the, of the, of the picture and you have all your sequences ordered down by value, and you have the timestamp of the video. So when you give this to the video coach, you just see, okay, most dangerous sequences in the game, 55th minute, I'm gonna go check it out, you know? And second most dangerous sequence, you know? It just wins a lot of time. And then you can filter by value sequence. So here I chose to just see the sequence more worth more than 0 0.10 expecting goals, just have three of them. Interestingly enough, Two of them are just uh, dump pins, but immediately followed by high ninja passes from behind the net. Or you can say just one second using its number and see how it panned out. So game or season analysis, I mean, you can visualize when the team was the most dangerous and how they did it. You can fast forward the video and game time. You can do the same for the opposition. You can filter back player. This is, for example, a full season of a defenseman and how he was implicated, uh, how he contributed to the sequences for a team, how he created danger. Um, you can scout teams and players using those stuff. Also, it's hard. No, it's, I'm, I'm joking, I'm joking, but I, I like it because that's that's like my baby and uh, okay I'm not objective but the, the joke is every time I posted one of those on Twitter the immediate reaction was yeah my kids do the same and fair enough fair enough okay so next I'm going to jump into a study that has not been published yet so hopefully next week on hockeydrive.com and it's what I call X goal contribution so I'm jumping into player analysis. So in soccer, you have expecting goals chain or expecting goals build up that basically share a sequence value equally between all the players involved. So you can have touched the ball once or 10 times, everybody gets the same share. And I think that's not fair. That's not fair. So my thinking was, why not share a total sequence value based on how the players contributed, you know, based on their action. And this is why I call the expecting goals contribution. So how do I do this? This is based on potential value of events, as you, you remember, remember. So this is a basic example, a sequence from the team of Grenoble in France, where you have a pass exit, potential value is 0 0.022 expected goals, they have a control entry, and you have a shot down, scoring chances. So you just need to establish the relative importance of each event between themselves in the sequence. So for my pass exit, what I do is I take my potential value of my pass exit and I divide by the sum of all the potential values. And it gives me 15% for the pass exit. So to wrap this up, my pass exit is 15% of my sequence. My control is 27% and my shot attempt is 58%. So here the shot attempt has the main bulk of the, of the sequence because it's the scoring chances, which means the player had to get there and you know put himself into position to get the damage shot. But if he had taken like a point shot, the control entry and the pass exit would have, have shared the main uh, value of the sequence. And you have to, beyond the stats, you have to think in that way. You had that great potential having gone through a successful control exit and a successful control entry, 
but in the end you have just a four point shot. So you should reward the guys that put the effort of getting the control exit and control entry. So to calculate my expected loss contribution, I just multiply my 15% of my past exit by my sequence total value that is of 0.085 expected goals based on the only shot that I have in that sequence. But my, for my past exit, it gives me 0.013 expected goals contribution, and it goes to defenseman Kai Hardy that did the past exit. Control entry was made by four Daniel Fleury and the shot as well. So for those two, we get 0.023 to 0.049. On this full sequence, Fleury gets 0.072 expected goals contribution, and Hardy gets the other 0.013. So to me, this is useful because so far we would have seen like, okay, Fleury gets a shot, Fleury gets the um, individual expected goals creation at 0.085, and he gets the control entry and Kyle Hardy gets a pass exit. But everything, you know, uh, in separate worlds and nothing would have been linked together. But now everything is linked together, you know, and based on what came after and how relatively it was important to what came after. So using sequences, basically everything I described so far can be used for team and player analysis. The happening rate, you remember? how often an event leads to a shot, you have that by player. I mean, you can know how often a pass exit by a Victor Enman leads to a shot for Tempa Bay. You can know what is the average expected goals created by Tempa Bay when it is based on a pass exit by Victor Enman. You can have the expected goals contribution by player. You put them by 60 minutes to compare apple to apples. Um, you can compare to your team average, to league average, et cetera, et cetera. And also, the last thing I do is to look at the share of the team total expecting those contribution. And to give you an idea, uh, an elite player will be around 15%. He would have had created around 15% of his team total expecting those contribution. And an average player is at 4 to 5%. So this is not visual, but that's the one I had stored for this article for months. So I just, I just kept it. But this was a game report on a, on a player from Grenoble, Guillaume Leclerc. He had a pretty good game, two goals, one assist uh, on that day. And so at the bottom left, you can see his expected goals contribution by 60 were of 2.11 that day. And compared to his season average of 1.41, that's a really good game. And even more compared to his team average, the great goal 57. And you have that also for the share. So on that day, he owned 26% of his team total expected goals contribution which is really, really good, even compared to the season average of 14%, even compared to the team average of 5%. And I just put another, another example on the right, which is comparing the 5 on 5 time on ice with the expected loss contribution, so you can have an idea of who did what based on the opportunity that they had. Um, finally, just like for scouting, you can use everything together and going through together and for like, this is an, a defenseman from Grenoble, Sebastian Bizayon, and you can see he likes to use the pass to exit the zone, okay? And his pass exit leads to a shot 29% of the time, which is close to league average of 31%, okay? Burn. But the average expected goals created when Sebastian Bizayon does a pass exit is just half the league average, 0 0.011, and the league average 0 0.021. But when he does a carry exit, he's on league average. So maybe he should try to do it a bit more. You know, try it more often. There is maybe something to change here. Also, he's a master at dumping the player at the right place. That's another question. So what's next? Um, obviously, I would like to add more events inside the sequences. You know, takeaways in the offensive zone will be, I think, pretty useful. Maybe face-offs. Maybe get more information on uh, any transition data, you know, what is the, the consequences of going through center ice versus going on the wing. Um, I'm pretty confident, and I will not be here otherwise today, that the whole concept is useful. And anybody I, I showed this and the team I worked for this year, the old told me this is great and useful. But I'm totally open that the formulas can be, especially if we dump more stuff into this and maybe we can rethink it a little. And finally, can we do something for defense, obviously? And I have no answer whatsoever for that point so far. 
And I didn't put it there, but obviously there is a lot of research that can be done based on, on sequences. And hopefully I will have maybe another paper later this year, like a coaches came to me once saying, okay, but you're telling me control entry is, is that more dangerous than a dumping, but what is the risk of creating a turnover? And so I reverse the formula as I look at, okay, if you fail the control entry, what did the other team get in the following sequences in their counterattack? And so I calculated the risk of, you know, risking a control entry versus risking a dumping. And so that kind of stuff you can do with sequences because you have the chain of events. You can see what happened after. So that's it for me. Uh, thanks you so much, Elisa, for organizing this. Uh, thank you, Asma and the OkiGraphs.com people. The Evolving One Twins for re reviewing that stuff. I think that was Josh, but I couldn't tell which one it is. And my mate, Matthew also for helping me tracking all of this. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. And if you have any questions, just shoot me an email or a message. And if you want to check Magnus Corsi and the stuff we had, we're on Twitter. and. Um, we have a, the Tableau page that uh, you can go look at. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we had one question uh, come through already in the chat, which was asking um, if you had any difficulties getting footage to track for the all the different leagues with uh, European sports institutions are uh, historically being quite sensitive um, about supplying that to the public. Yeah, it's it's getting better. I mean, in France, I as I told, all the data here is based in France, and I'm I've been dumping Swiss data recently. But in France, the whole uh, league is broadcast broadcasted by one channel online, so you can just pay the subscription and you have everything. Uh, for other league, you can pay companies that just gather all the videos in one place, and you can access to it. Um, and another question I uh, was asking, has there been any adjustment or consideration for neutral zone dump-ins that lead directly to a line change? Yeah, I should have mentioned this. Dump-ins that lead to a line change are not included in this. Basically, when I see a dump-in and that the full line is changing, I'm just not tracking it. So the dump numbers are not low because it includes the line change. It does not include the line changes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for presenting. Um, I know I was very excited to have you on. I think I was messaging you for like a couple of days. Yeah. Please present. Thank you. Um, you know, I quite like uh, seeing other people doing manual tracking for niche leagues. There's not too many of us around. So uh, yeah. thank you for presenting. Everyone else stick around. We'll be back in about five minutes time uh, with the next presentation. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Alicia.
Am I on? I don't know. Oh gosh. You are on, you can go. <laughs> okay, I'm on, sorry. Um, hi everyone, thanks for joining in this Saturday morning. Um, this is actually my first time presenting at any kind of analytics conference or anything like this. So I am very new to all of this and obviously, um, you know, working out the kinks. Um, but I'm here today to talk to you about the challenges and barriers to analytics in professional women's hockey in North America. Now, you'll notice that I'm very specific with my title because obviously there is professional women's hockey throughout the world, uh, but I don't know enough about it, you know, in Europe or Australia or any of those other places that I would feel comfortable talking about it there. Um, so I definitely wanted to limit it to talking about women's hockey in North America. I'm also limiting it to professional women's hockey because college hockey is kind of its own animal and just a totally separate thing. So before we get started, well, you know, I think everybody here is very into analytics. We all know that analytics in men's hockey has been growing pretty much what seems like exponentially over the last few years. Um, it seems like every time I turn on my computer, there's a new metric or a new sequence or a new something. Um, but where we see it falling behind is women's hockey. And of course, this is nothing new, right? I mean, women's hockey is falling behind, falls behind in men's hockey in a lot of subjects. Um, so it makes sense that it would follow along that analytics is not there either. But let's figure out how we can get to a better point. So today I'm going to talk about three different um, organizations that are considered or have been considered professional women's hockey in North America. Um, so the first is the CWHL, the Canadian Women's Hockey League, um, unfortunately folded uh, last year in 2019. Uh, but I still want to talk about that data from that league and how that league was run and how it kind of corresponds to the analytics that we're talking about today. The NWHL is the National Women's Hockey League that currently still exists, um, mostly in the United States, but they did just add a sixth team in Toronto. Um, and so I'd like to talk about, you know, kind of that league and how they handle analytics right now. And then the Professional Women's Hockey Players Association, which is really a fairly new organization. Um, comprised of, you know, in case you don't know, about 150 players who 
chose not to play in the NWHL or any other professional league in North America until they basically get what they deserve in terms of working conditions and pay and things like that. So I want to talk about those three organizations because each of them kind of have their own unique pieces to this that we're talking about. But before we get started into that, I just want to give you a quick introduction into who I am. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Melissa Burgess. I am a sports writer, uh, not by day, but by, you know, the rest of the time. I write for the Victory Press, as you can perhaps see on my shirt. Um, we are a independent sports coverage site. We are fully reader funded, and I have been covering the NWHL and women's hockey for them uh, since 2015 when the league began. So that's really where my connection to women's hockey and women's sports comes in. I also write for SB Nation's Die by the Blade of the Buffalo Sabres uh, site. I also write features for the Canisius College men's hockey team locally. And I work with a junior A hockey team uh, locally as well. And that is all, of course, in addition to my day job. So I think, you know, my coverage of women's hockey over the years makes me qualified to speak about this topic. And like I said, I've seen analytics in men's hockey growing, but I've seen where women's hockey is, you know, not up to that standard. So our first challenge when talking about data and analytics in women's hockey is where is the data? Because of course, in order to come up with those analytics, you need data, you need good, reliable data as well. And that is a, a sticky point here that um, I'll discuss in a minute. CWHL data, so as I mentioned, um, the Canadian Women's Hockey League folded in 2019, just over a year ago. Unfortunately, a lot of the data from that league was lost when it, the league folded. The website pretty much got wiped off the board. Um, you know, video access, which I'll talk about in the next um, slide, was also challenging. And so that data is just kind of gone, a lot of it. Um, thankfully, there are some sites out there who backed it up, but you know, you need data in order to put together analytics. And that is the first kind of point of entry for analytics. You need the data. When we're going into the NWHL, their data is there, but it's very limited. Um, their website does have, you know, basic box scores, basic statistics, but the information is not always necessarily accurate. And this is a problem, obviously, because if the data is not accurate, <laughs> then everything that comes from it is not going to be accurate. Um, I've noticed this particularly, you know, I'm at a game and I'm watching the game live and I see the play and I know this person, you know, player X had an assist, player Y had the secondary assist. But then in the box score, that may or may not be correctly reflected. So if that information isn't accurate, then obviously you're starting from a moot point. Um, but in addition, the data is also limited. We, there really isn't ice time uh, tracked by the league for the NWHL. I know, um, you know, there have been some folks who have worked on tracking ice time, uh, but it's not there from the league at this point. Um, so things like that, you know, the data is not there. So that's not a good starting point, obviously. And then when we're talking about the PWHPA, you now that's a completely different animal. Um, and, you know, there's some reasons behind that. The PWHPA just was in its first season. It's not really a league. It's a player-run organization. So things are obviously going to be different. But data for the PWHPA is kind of difficult to come by. Um, even just trying to find a roster for a showcase or for a weekend of games can be pretty hard. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was looking for rosters for some of the games that happened this past season because I was trying to track how many games a certain player had, had participated in. And I'll be honest, there were some showcases that I straight up could not find a roster for. Um, and there were others that I was kind of able to find a roster for, but only after digging through you know months and months worth of Twitter posts. And even then it was, you know, someone took a picture of a roster sheet that was at the game. So that doesn't even really tell me for sure that all those players participated because, of course, someone could 
you know, get hurt or have something come up where they can't make it. So, you know, even just the basic roster, if you can't even start with that, then you're really not starting in a good position. Um, but beyond that, the data is just not really there. There's no really score sheets. There's not really, you know, recaps of the games unless they've been done by independent journalists like um, Kirsten, my coworker at the Victory Press, I know, went to one or two showcases and she wrote up a piece about it, you know, that has some of those details with who scored and all that. But the basic box score isn't available online. So how can you get any data or any analytics when you can't even figure out who scored? Obviously, that's our first challenge. Once you have the data, the second challenge is getting access to video. You know, I think um, we heard the previous speaker talk about manually tracking and um, I know there was a question about video access and how willing were teams, you know, to give him video and all that. Um, for these professional women's leagues, video access can be difficult to come by. Not all CWHL games were broadcast. Unfortunately, that was just, you know, that's how the league would had to be run. That's the resources that they were able to work with. But, you know, if a game isn't broadcast, that will make it a heck of a lot more difficult to track and then to go back and track after the fact. Uh, NWHL broadcasts are, they used to be on YouTube and now this past season was their first year on Twitch, um, part of a three-year deal for Twitch. And that's great. Um, games are broadcast, but they're not always the top quality. Um, they, the angle of video is, you know, awkward. It's hard to see some players on the ice. Um, you're shooting through netting, which, you know, makes it difficult to see a player's number on the back of their jersey, uh, things like that. So the video may be there, but it may not be the best quality, which makes it hard to then use, you know, later on when you're trying to manually track or retrack a play. Or, you know, like I said, sometimes I'll go back to a box score and say, mm, I don't know if that's really who got that assist. Let me go to the video and check. And then the video is just unusable, really, for that matter, um, because, you know, maybe the player was in the corner and the camera doesn't catch the corner or something like that. So just little things like that, that, you know, once you even if you have the data, it's difficult to verify it if you're trying to do that. And then talking about the PWHPA, their broadcasts also need improvement. Um, of course, like I said, they were in their first year. They're a player-run organization, so they don't have that structure of a broadcast crew or, you know, the money for that kind of resource. But um, there were a couple games, you know, that were broadcast or were supposed to be broadcast through ESPN online, and I just straight up could not get them to work. I could not watch them at all. Um, other games that I watched were fine, but, you know, it's hit or miss. Um, so trying to go back and watch those videos for, you know, research purposes isn't always a great solution. So let's say you do have, you know, your data, you have your video, but the other problem here sometimes with women's hockey is the consistency. Um, so there's two kind of facets to this. One of these I actually did not put on my slide because I kind of thought about it after the fact as I was practicing this presentation, but in order for the analytics to be reliable, the data has to be reliable, right? So kind of what I mentioned before with the NWHL, how there would be, you know, an assist incorrectly marked in the box score. Well, that obviously that, you know, is incorrectly marked in the box score. It's incorrectly marked in the statistics. It's, you know, it, it changes everything down the line. Um, but also, one thing I noticed, particularly in the earlier seasons of the NWHL, I, I think it's mostly gotten fixed now, is that there was kind of a lack of consistency in how things were inputted. So I noticed at one point some teams were inputting, you know, goals as the elapsed time. And sometimes it was the other way around. And, you know, it's a little thing, but it's also a thing that you may not notice if you're not watching the game, if you're just, you know, looking at the box score and you're not looking closely, you may not realize that like, oh, well, wait, this game has it like this, but then this game has it like that. 
And it's just little things like that where there's not necessarily that consistency in reporting that, you know, makes your data a little less reliable down the line. Um, another part of this is uh, ice time. The NWHL doesn't really record ice time in its box scores, but with goalies, you know, obviously you record when a goalie gets pulled or, you know, when they come out of the net and when another goalie goes in. Well, that always wasn't consistently reported in the box score or it was inaccurate. So um, I know Mike Murphy is probably watching this right now and he's one of the speakers um, later. But I know he has been one of the people who's been working on, you know, making sure that there is that consistent data and kind of help. I remember a couple months ago, I kind of helped him go back through a little bit of historical data to make sure like, yes, this goalie really was pulled at this point, even though the league's box score doesn't show it like that. Um, so just that consistent data. And then for the PWHPA, they have their own issue because there's not really a consistent roster, which it's the nature of the organization. You know, they have some games in Toronto and then they have games in Arizona later in the season. And not all the players who were playing in this game are playing in Arizona or playing in Philadelphia. Um, so there's not a consistent roster, which is totally fine. But then obviously that makes it hard to track certain variables over a period of time or over a period of game. Um, you know, it's hard to say that you can't really say so-and-so is on a four game goal streak because you may not even know that they played in four games or, uh, you know, you can't really say, Oh, well, these two were great as line mates because you don't really have that information or maybe they played together in this showcase, but then the next showcase they were on opposite teams. So it's not so much a challenge, but just a, a variable to take into consideration that, there's not that consistency in the roster necessarily because of the nature of the organization. So it's harder to track certain variables over time. And then of course, like anything else, the other challenge here is time, money, and frankly, bodies. Um, any analytics, whether it's men's hockey, women's hockey, other sports, requires an investment of time from people who are willing to put in the work. And, you know, we've seen a lot of people step up in men's hockey, a lot more uh, men's hockey focused analytics websites, Twitter accounts, things like that. But women's hockey needs that support as well. Um, you have to be willing, you know, you have to have people who are willing to invest their time and, and sometimes their money um, into putting together this data, whether that means manually tracking it or coming up with formulas or, or you know, what have, what have you. Um, but that's always a challenge you know, even in men's hockey. Um, but you also have to have the buy-in from people who are willing to do the work, whether that's at the team level or it's, you know, volunteers or, or people like, you know, half of you who are watching this who are interested in the topic of analytics and you just have to be willing to invest yourself into it. And of course, take into consideration those barriers that we talked about. Uh, the good news is, but there are some women's hockey analytics out there and you'll hear much more about this uh, throughout the day. Actually, I made this slide before the uh, schedule was finalized, but obviously Alyssa, who is the host of this whole thing, um, and some of her fellow folks at the Even Strength website, um, they have a player comparison tool, which I particularly enjoy being able to compare, you know, Madison Packer from this past season to Madison Packer from the first season or two players from different teams over the course of the season. Um, you know, it's just little things like that, that that's really useful. And for me as a writer, um, it's a good tool to have. Also, Megan Chaika from Staffleys um, has done a lot of uh, analytics work on the international side. I think she's going to talk as part of the panel later today, but, you know, the IIHF um, and then even the uh, NHL All-Star Game where the women participated in that game. Um, there was some tracking done there and that's great to see all that. And then I just wanted to also shout out Mike Murphy who is speaking later today as well. Um, as I mentioned him earlier, he's really kind of dedicated himself to the NWHL's analytics side of things and making sure that the data out there is reliable or if it's not that we can find it and make it reliable or make sure it's accurate, fix it. So maybe you're watching this and you're fired up now and you're ready to help with women's hockey analytics. 
you have to be willing to put in the time and kind of step into the unknown because even though analytics are analytics across the board, you know, a, a sequence in men's hockey is really, it's the same idea as in women's hockey. It's not going to be, you know, different. Um, hockey is hockey. But it is the little, little, little bit of the unknown because things are a little different. As I said, the video is not as good. It, data, you know, isn't necessarily as reliable. Um, so be willing to step into the unknown and be willing to account for those barriers when you're working with the data that's out there. So, you know, be willing to cross check a box score if it says someone had an assist or or this was the time of a play. Be willing to accept the fact that you're not going to have ice time for players um, in terms of games. You're not going to know that. And um, Alyssa just asked, do you think more people would buy in if the league would make more and better available? Absolutely. You know, I think it's a big hurdle. People want to do the work, but, you know, if the video is not great, am I going to bother? If the data is not right and I know that, am I going to bother? Nah, probably not. Um, so I think it is an uphill struggle, just like anything else in women's hockey. I mean, I think we're working on getting things better. We're working on getting things to a more professional standard. And, um, you know, and maybe all of you can help with that. Um, so if you're willing to help, you know, you can reach out to these teams or these leagues or, you know, these organizations or or just start on Twitter with tracking a game and putting out a chart or, you know, one of those beautiful art pieces that we saw in the previous um, slides, um, you know, just be willing to put it yourself out there and reach out and offer the help. Math can be hard. Uh, I know a lot of analytics goes whew, right over my head. But supporting the growth of analytics in women's hockey really shouldn't be. Even though it can be an uphill battle at times, we can all help and we can make the analytics and the women's hockey community stronger for it. So that is my presentation. If you would like to reach me after this presentation, you can follow me on Twitter at underscore Melissa Burgess or check out my writing on the Victory Press or any of the other um, places that I mentioned. Uh, and no, well, firstly, thank you for the great presentation. Another real quick question from me, uh, particularly now that I do far less writing than I did when I first started out in women's hockey. What do you think is something that as a writer, particularly someone who covers both men's and women's hockey, that you would most like to see exist in women's hockey? Like if someone's sitting there being like, wow, I want to do something for the NWHL. The data is available. I can give it to you. Um, what would you like to see people do? You know, personally, for me, I think it would be really nice to see, um, you know, what players are on the ice together and how much. Um, it's a it's a basic thing, you know, but it's something that we don't really have because as a writer, that would be nice for me to be able to say, you know, Taylor Kersey and Kareem Bowie, you know, played together this much this season. And while they played together, they attributed for this many goals or this many shots or, or something like that. Um, so even just something as basic as that would be really nice to have. Um, because like I said, they don't really have ice time statistics out there from the league. So it's hard to piece any of that information together unless you're doing it, you know, manually. Um, and another question uh, from the chat, uh, which you, I think, will definitely have a better uh, gauge of than me. Uh, is there a sense in that the current women's leagues are interested in expanding their analytics? Because I know I definitely have my opinions on it, and I'm sure I will get into them later. But uh, how do you feel? <laughs> you know, I, I think that the interest could be there, but I also think it's difficult because they have so much else to focus on that obviously, you know, they just want to focus on having a broadcast and having it be watchable. And, you know, it's hard enough to find bodies to, you know, input goals into a computer, let alone find someone to be willing to come to the games and track a game. Um, I think, you know, the NWHL as a league would probably be more interested in analytics because, you know, I think that there would be a, a more longer term investment for them. Um, I think for the PWHPA, as I, I said, they're not really a league. They're an organization and they're player run. And, you know, so I don't really think they're, and this is not meant as a slight to anyone, but I don't think there really would be that interest in analytics from them because they're not really trying for that. They're trying, their focus is to 
get to a point where they get a professional league with the resources that they want, which, you know, I'm sure could include analytics down the line, but obviously their, their focus is on, you know, working conditions and pay and things like that more than the math side of things. Awesome. Well, thank you for your presentation. It's been great. Uh, if you want to contact Melissa, all the details are still on the screen for a moment. We will be back in about five minutes time for our coaching and analytics panel. So definitely one you do not want to miss. We will see you again then.
Good to go. Oh, good to go. Okay, hi. Hey, everybody. Um, this is Allison Lucan, and I'm thrilled to be here to facilitate the meeting of some great minds in coaching and talking specifically about analytics. Um, the less you hear from me, the better. So let's start by having everyone introduce themselves. Um, first, uh, I have to go with JFK. It's such a great name. Introduce yourself and, and tell us a little bit about how you're using analytics uh, with your teams today. Uh, yes, like you said, I'm uh, JFK. My name's John Kennedy, uh, originally from Michigan, but now I do reside in uh, Newcastle, New South Wales of Australia. Uh, I coach the Newcastle North Stars team of the AIHL, Australian Ice Hockey League. And um, I uh, we use analytics pretty much as any coach would to get more information about the game, uh, real-time information in between the periods to understand uh, trends that are happening with our team and the other team and to be able to filter that to be able to make uh, judgments on where we can switch our play around. Awesome. Danton, let's let the people know about you. Sure. I'm Danton Danielson. Um, I coach, or I'm from Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. I coach a team called the Prince Albert Mintos. We're a U18 AAA boys team. Um, I use analytics, I guess, you know, like, like John said, kind of to try to get that extra edge, that little bit of extra information that, that you can, that's available there. And, and to the extent that you're able to capture it, um, you might as well kind of use it, I guess, um, for, for us, the, the main ways that we're, we're using it are, are, um, for, um, assessing the players that we already have in our group and the, and the, and the way that we're playing as a, as a group. Um, we don't have access to data that allows us to use it for scouting and recruitment purposes to, to, to much of an extent. We can use kind of the old school stats that we can find on league websites and things like that to contribute to that. Um, but for the most part, we're looking at assessing our own play, assessing our own players, seeing if we can, you know, change line, line matchups, um, rotate players around the lineup to sort of, you know, provide better balance or, or, or whatever we're looking for in that respect. So that's, that's mainly how we use it, getting a little bit more into kind of trying to develop some, um, use of micro the more micro level stats like looking at uh, you know possession profiles and things like what happens when a particular player has the puck um but for the most part it's been a little bit more on the summary level to to this point awesome and we have a surprise guest who i'm thrilled to have with us jack uh, for folks who may not know about you and who you are give us a quick introduction to you and how you use analytics so hi everyone it's it's really great to be here so for the past three years i've worked in um, analytics player development scouting and most recently coaching for uh the toronto may police organization now i won't be back with the organization next year there's there's some loose ends i gotta tie up but I'll, i should be able to announce something very shortly um before um joining the leafs i started the analytics program at uh, mcgill university for their women's team a program that's uh, thriving right now so there's a lot I can tell you about what happens at McGill. There's not so much I can tell you about what happens in Toronto, but I'm happy to be here regardless. <laughs> awesome. And, and Drake, I saved you for last. If you can tell us about yourself, but also you've really taken this a step further and developed 
an actual software to, to help teams look at players through an analytical lens. Tell us about yourself and tell us about that project. Well, uh, I'm, I'm the coaching GM of Orlando, the Orlando Solar Bears. It's the East Coast Hockey League. And, um, you know, I started Stats Track, uh, I don't know how many years ago. It feels like a long time ago. But I did it uh, initially to help my, me and my career to try and get another contract. And I always found that numbers never lied. Um, I, I think it's important to now as a coach, I think it's important to be able to show the players uh, which way they're trending, where their strengths and weaknesses are. And, you know, everybody's perception is so different. And, and uh, when you can show them numbers to to show what you're seeing and how they're playing, I think their perception changes. And, and that's why, why numbers are so important. Um, you know, I, I love working with it. I, I uh our, our, our stats track is, is the is the software we developed and it's everything's done in real time. So in between periods, I can go talk to players about uh, uh, the way they're playing. I can go to the, the, the forwards, the centermen, uh, the wingers to see about draws, how we're doing. I, I know in the third period who my best uh, face-off guy is at each circle. So it's it's live, it's, it's uh, in real time and uh, we use it as much as we can, and I, I think the players love seeing that information as well. I think nowadays with the millennials, you have to be able to show them. You got to be able to show them with video, show them with numbers. You got to be able to demonstrate it on the ice. You got to be able to touch them in in every way that you can. And JFK, to that point, coming from a playing career to now a coaching career, what what have you learned about communicating the data like that to your players effectively so they take it in and don't just feel like it's maybe a report card or something like that? I, I think first you have to identify your team. Like when you identify what's important for your team, then you can show them within the statistics what's happening there. And I know growing up as a player, it was shots on net. You know, that was your basic, are we getting shots? Are we getting hits? But I mean, when you think about real analytics, it's deeper than that. It's not just shots. It's where are the shots coming from? Yeah, you can put 20 shots in a period. That's great. But are they all from the outside or are they all from one side or are they only on the power play? Um, it's those little things. So to be able to break that down in a period and say, hey, boys or players, um, look, we're not getting to the net. You know, all of our shots are on the outside. We got to start crashing the net. If they can see that and you can show them, look, these are where all the shots come. Then like uh, I get Drake said, it, it, it connects with that, that group of players that need to see everything that they're being told. Um, and it kind of builds trust as a coach when you can show those stats. It's one thing for the coach to say, I feel this because there's been plenty of times as a player where the coach is pissed off about the way we were playing. And I'm thinking, to be honest, even though the score may not be indicating, you know, that we're winning, I feel like we're doing well. But when you can show that, hey, this is what we're looking to do in the game. We're not getting the hits that we need or we're not getting the zone entries that we need. And these are the stats to go along with it. I just think it helps players connect to what's happening in the game. I, I, I also, if I, if I can say something onto that, I think it's important that, uh, you know, after like a five-game stretch, especially with a new team, um, you can see the trend that what makes your team successful and what it does when, when they're not successful. And you can get uh, immediate buy-in when you can show them those numbers and show the players their five-game stretch where they did really well. Well, this is why uh, you had so many hits. You had this amount of turnovers. You had this many zone entries and you had so many shots from, from wherever. That's why you had, that's why you had success. And I think like he, like I think we all know you get easier buy-in when you can uh, show them and it's not just what you're thinking. You have something to back yourself up. Danton, to that point, what, what do you see? I mean, I think all of us have seen this or heard about it at different levels of, you know, there's the old school hockey guy and then there's this numbers philosophy. What has been your experience kind of working within that old school culture and bringing in this idea of being based on analytics? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like it, it seems like there's, um, you know, it's like anything else. When, when you come across people who are sort of open-minded, self-aware, that, that regardless of kind of what background they come from, they're, they're typically pretty open to it and receptive. Um, there's other, I guess, there's other sort of points of view where, you know, I, I guess that the big, the big challenge is often that like false dichotomy, like the idea that you're either making all your decisions based on analytics or you're making none of them based on analytics. And so sometimes I think we run into trouble where, you know, if a, if a parent or, or another, you know, observer 
feels like we're making some decisions that they don't agree with, well, that must be because we're use, we're, ma- we're using analytics to make all of our decisions, you know? So I think that sometimes there's like a, a lack of clarity about just how we, we use analytics in conjunction with other things like video analysis, like observing things with our own eyes and things like that. So I think there's just some development that still needs to happen. I think as the game, um, as the game kind of opens up and we become a little bit more diverse, uh, people with different backgrounds, people that from playing backgrounds, people from outside playing backgrounds, more women getting involved, more, more people from other groups getting kind of getting involved in, in, into it. I think that that, that openness will continue to develop. And so that, you know, there is challenges related to the, the cultural aspect of it or the, you know, the, the hockey culture aspect of it. But I think those are things that are, that are, pretty manageable and, and it's, it, they, they don't, they don't sort of stand in the way from, from, you know, a coach just deciding to, to do it, to do it because it, it helps them, them make decisions. Jack, to that point, I know this was a question from, from our viewers on the, on the YouTube stream how, and some of the other coaches have spoken to this. How receptive are players when you come in and say, you know, based on what the numbers tell us, we should be playing like this, or these are the tactics we should employ. How, how do you work those kind of communications and strategies into being a coach of a team? I, I don't personally believe it, it's super important for, for players to know the numbers necessarily, but how I've used analytics uh, in player development at McGill is, is to tell a story. And, and there, there's one very kind of vivid example that I, I can talk about. It's um, I coached a girl named a, a, a young woman named Rachel Santini at McGill. So right hand defenseman, uh, very smart. Uh, feet are, feet were a little bit slow, but you know, a, a, but she's always had excellent you know coursey stats or you know um, in terms of exits and entries because you know she makes such good reads and and um, you know she just makes plays earlier, right? And, and that's how she gets that competitive advantage and. You know, she had been going through a hard time because she studies engineering, very challenging program, lots going on. Um, and, you know, she was lo- searching for confidence. She was having some injury troubles. And uh, one day during the off season, I, I went to have lunch with her and her dad and we sat down. We, we looked at some, some video of, of her playing and, and I just said, you know, there's so many positive things that we can take out of your game. Now, you know, there were some technical details in terms of her skating or in terms of her puck play that you can clean up. But, you know, the, the fundamentals were really good. And, and then we talked about how she could adjust her training or what kind of things that she could focus on, which, you know, weren't necessarily the things that she had in mind. So it's really to, to identify, um, you know, that, that fundamental, I would say, that unique fingerprint of a player and then use it to emphasize their strength and then downplay their weaknesses. Awesome. Drake, we, we were kind of on this whole communication acceptance level. You have a tool that you have that you sell to other teams. What are, you, what are you seeing on the acceptance in terms of other teams at all levels wanting to bring in analytics, wanting to bring in systems di- driven tracking of data? Well, I, I think you're a fool if you don't uh, use every tool available. So um, every AHL team, NHL team that I, and the East Coast League team has, has some kind of uh, system that they're following and um you know i i i think that old school way of thinking is, is gone out the door i'm an old school guy but uh you know you have to go with the times you have to be willing to learn new stuff even with systems and and the way you talk and treat players you've got to go move with the times. so i think most of the uh most of the coaches nowadays all believe in it i think a lot of them have a hard time understanding it um, you know, that's why it's important now, especially with no hockey, it's a, it's a great time to take courses and, and to learn how to use those numbers in a positive way. So for the most part, though, I think everybody's accepted. They realize it's a part of the game and it's an important part of the game. JFK, can you just sh- share with us? I mean, even we've heard this morning already, even at the highest levels, we still have to do a ton of manual tracking to get the kind of data that we want how are you getting your information and, and is timing an issue for you? Because of course we have to respect the time it takes to get some manually driven data, but you need to turn that around for lessons and coaching. Would you share with us your experience there? Oh, uh, look, so ice hockey here in Australia isn't one of your main sports. It's cricket, it's rugby, it's AFL. Um, so for us, most of the teams in our league, some of them do analytics. I'm going to say majority don't. We have eight teams. I'd probably say three to four teams do it. I would say we're a pioneer when it comes down to those analytics. 
Um, so our way post game, we use crossover. I think that was probably one of the best softwares where you could just upload a game and then they can give you the shifts and everything for the, for, uh, for that player and to be able to go over it and be able to come back with something during that week of practice to be able to tell players their mistakes and not their mistakes, but where we can improve. All right. We're not just talking about mistakes. We're talking about the good and the bad. Um, but like in game analytics, we had Alyssa. So I know she was doing some stuff, but she is a whiz. And like you're talking about a human computer that was literally counting shots, knowing when there was high pressure points where a team got two to three shots in a five, like in a minute period or something. Like so high volumes of shots, whether they were power play, whether they were PK, zone entries and things like that. So that's one person open book just going for it. Um I remember back in college, we had, you know, the eye in the sky. You had someone that was high in the stands that was being able to re- relay something back to an assistant coach in their headpiece, which, you know, that's when you have a team. That's when you have thousands of dollars. That's when you can pay someone to do it. So, look, I, it plays a big part. Um, like I said, ours is very manual. Uh, I don't know. If you, I think there are some automatic systems where players can wear like a, a a chip or something that follows them around the ice. So you can see top speed, their heart rate and all those different things. And look, and all those, all those analytics help, but you got to start somewhere. And that's where we're at at the moment. Dayton, you've kind of seen both worlds, right? The manual and then kind of moving to the systems based, just maybe share with us the challenges, the benefits moving from one world to the other in that sense. Sure. So um, when when, I, when we first started with this, when I was at a younger younger age level, I had an assistant coach that would sort of sit in the stands, and we developed a bit of a, a, a tracking system that worked pretty good for us for for you know what the resources that we had, which were none basically. Um, so we 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 developed kind of a method where where he could track like who was on the ice and then what events were occurring while those players from our own team were on the ice. Um, and then I have a little bit of a proficiency with MS Excel. So we kind of developed some macros and things like that to help crunch that into some reports that we found useful. Now I've moved that I moved up a little bit. We have a little bit more resources with the organization I work for. So we use iceberg system. Um, so it's an, sort of an automated video system where they kind of crunch the data for us. Um, and of course, that's that's a lot less resource intensive for us in terms of manual data collection time. It also doubles with our video analysis, which is a nice little aspect to be able to like identify, okay, here's where a series of shot attempts took place. Let's look at that video. Like, like let's let's click on that and look at the video that's linked right to that, to that, um, to those events that we're looking at statistically you know there is though there's times that i miss the manual world a little bit um there's a bit of like an 80 20 thing that goes on in in the automated world where you get you know a lot of information that maybe only a small a small segment of it is what's really useful and so you have to sift through things there's also for me my curiosity often drives things and so access to the raw data is really important for me. Um, so that's where, again, in the man, the manual tracking world, there were there were things like I could I could set the reports up literally exactly how I wanted them. Where in the in the automated world, I'm kind of working with what the system provides. So there's there's pros and cons to each, each method. I I don't think with either one it they don't they don't really facilitate well the real time analysis. In fact, there were some things with the manual that we could get, like my, my assistant coach would come down in between periods and we'd be able to see like, okay, so this line on the ice right now, we're getting caved in. So we have to change that matchup or we have to juggle the lines or something. Um, whereas now we're sort of waiting until after the game to upload the video and have all the, the number crunching take place. So it's a bit, it's a bit of a, in both cases, it's a pretty reflective um, process as opposed to real time, the way we've used it to this point. Um, but, uh, yeah, like definitely very valuable either way. And, and I think with the manual, I wouldn't let the manual aspect dissuade anybody from trying to wade into this. You can get a pretty good swath of information, um, with one person, I think doing some tracking, if you kind of think about it. And Jack, you've been at different levels and I'm not asking specifically about teams you've worked with, but (laughs) do you have a feel where, where do teams kind of fall on that spectrum? as a whole. And of course it's dependent on the level of the play as well, but in terms of relying on manual tracking versus being able to use data from outside systems and tracking systems. So um, 
just to kind of echo what Dan said, like, I, I think manual tracking is great, you know, for people who are looking to get into hockey or learn more about hockey or uh, develop comfort with th this side of hockey. I think it's, it's the insights that you get are, are surprisingly high quality. You know, like I've tried most of the automated tracking systems out there in terms of the data and the video clips that you get. And you know what, like manual tracking is right up there. And the only thing is, is that in terms of, you know, if you want to get a lot of insight in a very short amount of time, it's not the best. Um, at McGill, we have a kid, um, Mick, who's really, really bright. And he's been doing some um, kind of computer, uh, computer vision tracking for, for the girls team. But, you know, we, we have him do manual tracking all the time also. And I think it really has improved his hockey IQ. So anything that you do in terms of manual tracking is going to carry over in terms of your ability to be more effective developing a, an automated system. On the other hand, you know, with the automated system, you can, you can probably work faster and prioritize a little bit better uh, in terms of, you know, let's say if you want to see all the hind agent passes or all the uh, entries or all the chances or all the shots and goals, like, you know, it takes 30 seconds as opposed to maybe 30 minutes or 30 hours. Drake, with, with stats track, when you're talking to a team or a coach, are they already doing some manual tracking and they want more? Or are you introducing this whole idea to them from scratch? What's your experience on the on the what the teams are already doing by the time you're talking to them? Well, I, when I was assistant coach, I had to do a lot of the manual stuff. So I'm I'm very thankful for everything being done electronically now. So <laughs> uh, it made my job a lot easier, made my work week a lot shorter. So um, you know, I think a lot of them are, are, are doing it manually. And, and this is what's nice about stats track. It's, it's in real time. So you can see where the turnovers are coming. Uh, you can call a guy can call down to the bench. If you wanted to, we have radios there and, and let us know. I can find out in, in five seconds who my best face-off guy is at, at, at once at whatever circle we're at for a timeout. So I, I enjoy the, everything being done, uh, that way, but, uh, most guys aren't used to it, and, and this is why I think it's important to take courses so they, they understand where they can get their information from and, and how to use it. We'll wrap up with this one. It's always this way with coaches. I wish we had hours and hours to talk because you guys are, the, are on the ground level. But we'll just go around the group, and if each of you could share maybe your biggest takeaway from being able to apply maybe advanced analytics to your team or teams, and then something you're still hoping you could eventually be able to track or gain from advanced analytics and JFK, I'll start with you. Uh, yeah, look, at the end of the day, um, analytics are the, the new age. It's like, it's if you're not doing this, you're behind. Uh, I remember reading an article, it could have been in the early 90s, when the butterfly for the goaltending, where some people were like, this is never going to be a thing. Fast forward 10 years later, it's the staple of goaltending. So we have to get beyond this old school mentality of, you know, it's just, like in me, I'm a grinder. I was a grinding player and you couldn't measure my heart, you know, and at the end of the day, as a coach, we're going to take in all the information that we can, but there are some X factors that players have and that they possess that we have to be able to say, look, you know what, even though the stats may say this, I believe in this player for X, Y, and Z. But at the end of the day, it just gives us a better way to be able to evaluate, to be able to put our team and put their best foot forward. So um, I enjoy using analytics. I see the value in it. I'm a nerd, so I like numbers. Um, but moving forward, I guess for us, it's just being able to have those different pieces of software and finding which analytics are the most important for your team. Um, I know we were introducing more as the, we have only done it for a year, but as the season progressed, I realized as a coach, there's more things that I wanted to know that were happening on the ice. So um, just kind of as the game grows, the analytics grow, um, the different um, things that we want to know about the game grows. So uh, I'm just happy about the future. I want to grow myself and uh, yeah, just happy to be a part of this uh, panel. Danton, how about you? Biggest benefit to date and what's on the top of your wish list? Yeah, I think just the benefits, I think mo mostly come from, for me, the, the way that I, that it changes your thinking about how you approach coaching. Um, when you think more in terms of like probabilities and percentages and, and you think in terms of rates and you understand sort of like the, you know, the sort of like exposure to situations that affect what, what a player, the opportunity that a player is going to have and how you can't just look at like raw numbers to tell, to, 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 to paint a picture. You have to sort of know, you know, the opportunity that that player is getting also. 
Um, I think, you know, so I think that probably that's the biggest thing is just like, not so much the actual numbers that you're getting, but the way that thinking in this way sort of changes your approach to coaching. Um, as far as uh, where I'd like to take things a little bit with with my with my analytics work is is I kind of mentioned early on about that this idea of like individual profiles for players based on on stats and and based on kind of what what those stats are saying about how they play. So like one thing I was messing around with this last year was trying to create like a possession profile for a player. So when that guy gets the puck, what happens with it? You know, like there's a number of, you know, pretty, pretty finite categories of things of outcomes that can take place when a player has the puck. So what are those things? And can you break that down? Can you play that? Can you compare that to other players on your team and say, you know, well, 25% of the time they turn it over or 10% of the time it ends up in a play to the net, you know, things like that. Um, that's kind of where I'd like to take, to take my analysis. Um, and, and I, I think that in the bigger picture sense, I'm, I'm just kind of, you know, looking forward to see where, how things unfold and progress. Uh, you know, like I, I think that all the time new things are getting discovered and, and so I'm just, I'm just kind of looking forward to trying to stay connected and, and, and keep an eye on it. Awesome. Jack. Well, um, obviously analytics is not, it's not a very warm and fuzzy topic, but, but actually for me, it does elicit very strong emotions because, you know, it's a tool that you can use to change lives. You know, I, I, I talked about how I, how I was able to be a better coach for, for Rachel uh, having access to analytics. But, you know, uh, during my time in quarantine, I've, I've studied some players and one player in particular was PK Subban, who, you know, I know from way back when we were both in Montreal. And, you know, obviously he was, he was a below replacement player last year making $9 million. So, you know, financially, I'm sure he's very comfortable, but but I think, you know, he wants more and, and his fans want more and his coaches and his managers want more. And, and looking at him play, like I'm seeing these same types of, you know, incredible opportunities that, you know, kind of stats kind of point the way in terms of where he can be better. And, and I think there, there's, there's a way out for him to, to be a great player until his late thirties even, but he's got to change a few things. Now I know this because looking at his outputs, there are things that need to change, but then, you know, you can start setting up an action plan. You can start working on things that obviously he's got to put in the work, but the, the direction that we set, I think can change his career, can change his destiny. So, so I think that's really where the power of analytics lies. Apparently PK needs Jack's phone number. <laughs> Drake, we'll, we'll give the final word to you. Share with us your thoughts on, on what you've been able to achieve through analytics and, and what you hope comes next. Well, I think, I think everyone has said it, that it makes you a better coach. I think knowledge is, is power and power gives you the ability to communicate better. better. Um, I, I enjoy being able to use it with my players. I think they all find it fascinating and, inter and interesting, especially at my level. Um, you know, we don't have the budgets that NHL teams and AHL teams do. So to be able to show them their numbers and be able to show that part of the game is, is something that uh, they all enjoy. Uh, I, I love uh, Jack's story about the, the girl who did everything right and she wasn't very well recognized. And, and that's something I, I wish that uh, more minor teams would do to, to sell those type of players because just because you're not the flashiest player, you still are very good at what you do and and there's a place in the game for everybody and uh, i wish that uh, more people would embrace it and use it to you know help players move along you know we send out our stats to to our american league gms so so they can see the numbers and hopefully get those guys moved back up to to where they want to to, to get to and and to follow their dreams so i love using the numbers it's helped me as a coach and as a human being it's it's helped me be a better coach it's helped me with my communications uh, I just, uh, I think numbers don't lie and, and uh, perceptions are, are different. So I think it's important for that trust factor. Well, on behalf of all of the ISOHack attendees, thank you all for giving your time and knowledge today. It was invaluable. I loved our conversation and thanks to Alyssa for putting on a great event and I'll turn it back over to her.
You can start. Micah, you are good to go. Also, we can hear your stream audio, so maybe mute YouTube. All right, very good. Sorry, I'm just, I, I got distracted by the music. It's all my fault. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for for coming out, as it were. The uh, and thank you, of course, to Alyssa, for for running such a conference for us. The uh, I uh, I'm here to tell you about penalty rates. It's all a bit um, slapdash, as you'll see by my standards. The uh, but but I've been I've had a little idea niggling at the back of my mind for a long, long time now about penalties. And and before I even get started, I have to give uh, a particular shout out to Mike Lopez, who's been doing yeoman work about this um, for the longest time. In particular, the, he's been focusing on a detail that we're going to come to later about, about game management and even up penalties, that there's a distinct possibility that, um, that referees are calling penalties to even them up. So we're going to try to get a hold of this idea um, with a regression model. So first of all, we're looking at penalties and I'm interested in why are penalties being taken? So what sorts of things affect how often a team takes minor penalties? And then of course, because we're doing things quantitatively, how much do those things matter? And so we're gonna try to figure that out with a, with a model measurement today. So how are we gonna approach this? What's the overall approach? So we're in the same way we approach everything with a penalized regression model. And the mathematics, we're going to keep the mathematics down to a dull roar. In fact, there's going to be very, very little of it, um, which means that you have to trust me more. The, but I've discovered that, that a lot of the mathematical details are best left uh, after the fact to people who have curious questions. So what we're doing is a regression with terms. We're going to have terms for every single player. We're interested in isolating specific player impacts. So we're going to have draw terms and take terms for every player. So how much does an individual player affect how much their team takes penalties? And so the contrast, we're going to come back to this at the end, the contrast between individual penalties and team penalties is going to be important here. The other thing, so some of the earliest, um, some of the earliest work on penalties, so Tor Purdy years and years ago, God rest his soul, the, has isolated some score effects. So we knew about score effects in shots. A lot of my research has been about score effects in, shot, in shots. So one of the things we're gonna to touch on is score effects in penalties. The More obviously, um, we're gonna to try to look at where penalties are taken, um, or rather where, where you start your shift affects where penalties are taken. So intuitively we expect that um, the players who start their, their shifts in particular zones will have more or fewer penalties. We'll see about that. Um, also, I noticed a surprising effect on shot effects from second period changes. And so I'm looking at that the also. So what happens when you are playing in the second period? Is there an effect there? Um, and then we're also, and this is again a, an idea of, that Mike has, has particularly harped upon, is who took the most recent penalty? The, how is that affecting what goes forward? Uh, and so the overall structure is extremely similar to, uh, to my day-to-day -day player ability estimate model, um, which is called Magnus. And so if you like, we'll have a whole suite of things, but we're not looking at shots, we're looking at penalties. So instead of telling you the mathematical details of how I took such a thing, I'm just gonna tell you that I did it and we'll start right away with results because we're gonna try to get to the heart of this um, speedily. 
So we're going to see a lot of plots that look like this. Um, the Every time you see a number in this graph, if you see a positive number, it means that the relevant people took took more penalties. The, and so I fit this the same way that I fit the, all the other stuff where I have, once you have, once you have a regression model, it's extremely tempting. Once you have like the, the sort of structural setup, uh, it's extremely tempting to use it again and again and again. The is exactly the same thing that people were talking about in the coaching panels, that, that as soon as the moment a coach had something set up, the moment they had some sort of system set up where they've got information about something, all of a sudden they're like, oh no, we like this. No, we want more of this. Let's do this again for this. Let's do it again for this. And the same is true for, for every tiny bit of infrastructure work you do. For, and, and so that, that fits in also with the NWHL stuff too. You know, there's a lot of boring, boring, thankless work that needs to be done. The, as Melissa made very clear to get data into places where we can use it. But if you do that, what you'll open up is enormous and people coming after you, you'll see that this floodgate effect. Uh, and so I, I'm finding this even in my own work. So this particular thing is, is the most obvious thing. We're starting with something that, that contains essentially no surprises. So if you start your shift in the defensive zone, that by itself makes your team more likely to take penalties. So that's not surprising. Uh, and if you start your shift in the offensive zone, you're less likely than that to take penalties. Um, and so this is fit over every year um, with the estimates from each previous year chained into the ones before. So just like my shot model that I've been using before. So we're updating information um, every year on year. But what's a little bit more interesting, uh, I lied a second ago, but it's all lies, right? I, st I uh, when, when I said that there were no surprises whatsoever, slightly surprising to me was that shifts that begin in the neutral zone contain many, many fewer penalties, um, which is perhaps sort of one of those things that's a little bit surprising, in particular, fewer penalties than when you start in the offensive zone, which is which I, I would have expected right off the hop for the offensive zone to be at the bottom. Um, but then part of why that's interesting, part of why that maybe that does fit is that uh, the neutral zone is really boring. Nothing happens on shifts that start in the neutral zone. You really, you really need to get the puck uh, close-ish to a net before people start to really pay serious attention. Uh, and of course, there's no on the fly starts because I decided to use on the fly starts as the reference. So if you like, you can imagine on the fly ones as being zero by definition in, in this sort of approach. So starting in your own zone makes you more likely to take a penalty than starting on the fly. Um, that, that's no surprise. And the neutral zone is boring, as we said. The score, the, if we break up the score, and I decided to attack the score in the same way that I did before. So this is for the home team. Um, to try to get a hold of home and away effects, I decided to, to map the score out by um, venue. So the, I did the home team score, and then on the next slide, I'll show you the away team scores. So this is the home team. Um, relative to tied, you need to have a base state, a reference state, no matter what you do. And so I decided to use the home team tied for that. Uh, so the, the first of all, the big takeaway is that if you are winning, you are more likely to take penalties. That's, that's consonant with a theory of, of hockey teams that are winning as um, sitting back, as being reactive, as, as um, you know, putting yourself in a place where you have to take penalties. And more interestingly, the uh, and of course, a matching effect that when they're losing, they tend to draw penalties. And we get an idea of the range here. Notice the, the Y scale here. So all of that all of that score effect roughly happens within a minus 10 to plus 10 range. So the units for that are, um, uh, sorry, I should have said already, the units that I'm using are penalties um, per thousand minutes. So that's a lot of minutes. Um, so I'm just trying to trying to get a scale that, that feels natural and intuitive. So something where, where you get numbers we can handle like five and 10. Um, and so, but that's gonna be the consistent scale throughout. And in fact, I also should have said um, for technical points that for this sake, I'm only looking at penalties that are committed at five on five, and I'm only looking at non-offsetting minor penalties. One, one easy way to fool yourself with penalty work is to fail to exclude offsetting minor penalties. Uh, Crucially, they don't they don't change the um, skater power for either team because they're offsetting, um, and so they don't they don't have the same structural effect. In some sense, you should think of them as completely different things, um, especially because as anybody who's watched a fair bit of hockey will know, um, frequently the the offsetting penalties have a different 
function in terms of game management, where you can you can tell qualitatively that referees are more willing to give out non-offsetting penalties than they are willing to give out uh, sorry, more willing to give out offsetting minors than they are to give out non-offsetting ones. And so I'm focused on the non-offsetting ones because they're the ones that um, that change the skater state. So there's also a little curious detail um, that we'll come back to uh, in a moment, which is that that minus three number is not below all of the other ones. So losing makes you less likely to take penalties until you're really losing, and then all of a sudden it's different. So blowout states are, are, are weird somehow. And also that big spike in 12-13, that's the lockout. I have a little sticky note reminding me of exactly when the lockout is so that every time I see something strange in my data, I can go, is that the lockout year? Yes, it is the lockout year. So winning teams take fewer penalties, but not right away. Go back to this, we see that plus one. The, we're not seeing that, um, that really big change. We're seeing that once they're up by two, then the, that's a much more marked change. So there's a, a transition there um, from plus one to plus two that's more substantial than from zero to plus one. And losing teams home teams take fewer uh, until they're being blown out and then and then um, the pattern reverts. Lockout year was real world, we knew that. So here's away teams. Now notice the scale here. It looks similar again with the positive scores, with the winning scores up at the top. The, but, but more interestingly, the, the whole scale is shifted. So away teams just take more penalties. The, so very little bit in the negative, only a little bit, only when losing. Um, and that only recently. So those score effects are also changing over time a little bit. So abbreviating that winning teams take more penalties, losing teams take fewer, and there the transition happens right away, even a single goal. So that's consistent with what we know about um, the way that road teams play as well. That if there's, uh, and my work on, on shot rates for score effects suggests that they're the driven by winning teams. And so, here we're getting an idea that a home team is not content to sit in this sense on a one goal lead. They wait until they're up by two and then they feel a little bit more safe. Whereas a road team, once they're winning even by one, you see behavior changing right away. And so, you know, there's a, there's an asymmetry there, which, which I'm, I'm breaking because of what I know about something else. And so I'm choosing to interpret that that way. So that's, that's not the only way you could take that. Same deal, of course, but once you're getting blown out, then, then the rate your penalties that you take is, uh, is no longer particularly clear. Now, this is much more interesting. The, so these three terms, long change, switch, and repeat, are the, the three of the remaining structural terms, if you like. We're gonna talk about players um, in a minute. So repeat, so the base state here, I decided to take as the state when no penalties have been called. After all, that's the one state that you can be guaranteed is going to happen in a game. After all, not every game has a penalty. Not every game has a non-offsetting minor penalty called at 5 on 5. Not any game has a penalty at all. So repeat is the tendency to, to call a penalty on the team that you called the last penalty on. And switch is the opposite, is the, is the tendency, is uh, the effect of, of calling a penalty on the team that did not take the last minor penalty. Uh, so confirming what Mike and a number of other people have found is that that switch term is persistently about 10 penalties um, per thousand minutes more than that repeat term compared to, and, and also you see that repeat term being low tells you that that the willingness of a, of a I mean, well, we don't wanna to ascribe too much causality without knowing what we're talking about, but the, the tendency for a team that has not, that, ha that took a penalty to take the same penalty again is lower than the tendency for the first penalty in a game. The, whereas switching is higher than that. So the fact that they, it's not just the difference between them that's interesting, but the fact that they straddle zero, that reference point is, is curious. Um, but then of course the real shocker to me is that the effect of playing in the second period, independent of all of those other things, independent of who is playing, independent of the score, independent of who took the last penalty, is even more substantial. The second period itself, that, that structural effect of having to play far from your bench, of having to, have the, having to defend the net, which is far from your bench specifically, is, appears to be quite strong and leads to penalties for both teams. So playing Wittershins brings out the infractions. And, and so the, the immediate question is, why would that be? Especially once you've controlled for all those other things, you know, matchups are not gonna be, presumably not gonna be the thing once you've controlled for the players on the ice. Um, and so the most obvious thing to me is that perhaps there's some sort of effect from fatigue from longer shifts. Um, in fact, speaking of um, 
of fatigue from longer shifts, there's, uh, there's some evidence from um, Ingrid Rollin, a student of, um, uh, a collaborator of Mike Lopez's. Um, she found the, we're going to come back to her work in a moment, actually. She found in a, uh, an excellent article that was published in Hockey Graphs that, um, that penalty rates were largely flat for most things across most periods, but sunk very early in periods and spiked very late in periods. And so that's consistent with a fatigue related effect there. Um, the, and then of course the, you know, not, not to, not to get lost in the subtleties to, to not bear the lead that that, that key point about even up calls, about calls, I mean, that are called on the team that did not take the previous penalty, you know, that, that's a persistent effect that has been in the league for a long, long time. Uh, of course, the really interesting question is, you know, the, the obvious interpretation that many people have, have seized upon uh, is, uh, and, is that refs are responsible for it, that refs are remembering what they have done and they are choosing to interpret the game differently. Uh, in, and there's certainly some anecdotal evidence, I mean, even from what referees themselves have said, that that is in fact present. But then there's also the possibility that the players are the ones who remember. The, and after all, players respond strongly to incentives, especially the ones set by their coaches about what sorts of penalties are acceptable um, and what quantity of penalties are acceptable and what kind of play is acceptable. The, and so, so that effect is difficult to mediate from, is difficult to disentangle from, is it a ref effect, which is driving it, or is it a player effect, which is driving it? So one possibility that I didn't get to in this, in this work that I'm interested in doing for future work, where you might be able to get a hold of that is because in the NHL, we do have some data about, and we don't know specifically which referee calls a penalty, but we do have the names of the referees who officiate each game. So we could nail it down to one of two referees. And so with a bit of, a bit of hard work, I feel like we could tangle out, are we going to see, if we see um, variation from ref to ref, which is very substantial, then that might suggest that uh, that the effect might be being driven by the players. And if instead we see an effect which is very small of variation from ref to ref, then that suggests that that the officiating crews for the NHL are, are acting um, in an extremely similar way. And that would suggest that you would have um, more like a culture issue, more like a more like a this is how NHL refs behave as a group. So moving on to, to some individual details, the if you're going to look at, if you're trying to compare you can move past just this guy took this many penalties, this person drew this many penalties, and instead look at team effects on penalties drawn by their teams, then you can start to look at, at who comes out best of all. And so I've, I've, I didn't bother to include the numbers, um, although the, I'll show you a little bit of the range in a second the, to give you a sense of, of sort of overall scale. But, um, but the best in order are McDavid, Zabanajad, Pedersen, Connor Bonneman, we'll come back to that, Brady Kachuk, Nick Ehlers, Miles Wood, Oscar Sanfis, Nazem Kadri, and Brad Marchand. So pretty much, pretty much a, a list of who's who in the league of a particular type, in particular a fast type. You know, the, the thing that really springs to mind when you see all of those players, that especially the inclusion of somebody like Miles Wood, is really fast. And then of course, the so if you can't be fast, you can be annoying. So you can be like a Brady Kachuk, or you can be like Brad Marchand, who of course is also reasonably fast, the, but then there's also a handful of players who are really, bit, are really, uh, um, you know, you're not exactly household names around the league. Connor Bonneman is an inclusion there. He's a um, a fourth liner for the Flyers, um, and one of the things that you can do as a fourth liner to make yourself extremely valuable is um, draw penalties. The, and so, but it's notice in particular that it's interesting that the that you can look at a list like that. And despite the inclusion of a couple of people who are a little bit unusual, maybe you still still see an obvious skill trait coming through. The, and so then on the other side, the, the players in the most recent season whose effect on their team to draw penalties is really bad. The, um, William Carlson is having a much worse year than his breakup the other year. Um, Ryan Strom, remember that name, Nikita Zaitsev, the, like a bad penny turning up. Um, Reeves, Delorier, Sean Walker, Brent Seabrook, Dustin Braun, Boone Jenner, Neil Pionk. They're, and again, you, you have a pretty clear skill deficit, which jumps out at that, which is not having lots of foot speed. This is one area where, where, where we're seeing particular skill appear. On the other side, if you want to talk about taking penalties, the, the people who are best at 
taking penalties. So that best in this sense means most helpful to their team. So these are people who don't take penalties, whose teams are not taking penalties when they're on the ice, even after controlling for all of those other factors. And so here you get a much more interesting list. You know, the best penalty drawers were mostly all stars, the best penalty takers, the best improving their team by means of penalty takers, apart from Alex Petrangelo, who's justifiably in Norris talk recently, you know, there's not a lot of people that you would say, you know, are on the marketing flyers for their teams. Uh, this is, this is, you know, what, going back to the, to what came out at the end of the coaching panel about one of the things that I love also about analytics is being able to dig out contributions from people who, who, you know, with some exceptions aren't being really lauded for, for particular play. You know, this is an easy way that I can find to, to, find things that are admirable about players uh, that that might not be on the score sheet you know and you can you can get a lot of mileage and a lot of cheap heat out of pointing out players who are bad um, and we're going to do a little bit of that you know there's the there's there's a value in that right in the sense that there's value in any player evaluation as long as it's true but there's something a little bit more emotionally satisfying about being saying oh you know these guys the you know don't get a lot of press but in fact they're really good in fact, we're going to get an embroidery of that in a second. Um, the worst for takers, so these are, of course, are people who are who are causing, we hope, if, if the causality is being captured in any way, who are associated with their team taking more penalties. So Alex Edler is, is top of the list. In fact, he's clear by an enormous distance. The, um, Sam Bennett, Nicholas Camano, the, um, we're getting a few names that you might not know so well. Ryan Strom is the only person to appear on, on two lists. <laughs> Um, Sam Laffrey, Ovechkin. The, so some of the, um, uh, I think a lot of the criticisms of Ovechkin's defensive ability are a little bit um, overstated. But this is one area where where you see a real weakness, and so that's interesting when you when you can isolate weaknesses in star players. Uh, um, Lindstrom, Lazon, Jake Gardner, Evander Kane. You know, a lot of those names are well known, but a lot of those names are guys who actually don't have a great deal of of time in the league. And the method that I'm using strongly tamps down certainty about players who um, who don't have a lot of minutes. You know, the, the method is a, a zero biased method. Um, and so, you know, if you only have a handful of minutes, you're going to come out as extremely close to average by, by construction. The, and so, so it's interesting that, that one of the few ways in which you do see some of those players with fewer minutes is that they, they crop up in, in areas where they take a lot of penalties. Um, and then of course you have selection biases as well, right? Because, because penalties are salient, they're very obvious. And if you take a lot of penalties and if you're associated with your team taking a lot of penalties, you might not get very many minutes because coaches are going to reduce your minutes for that reason. The, I was interested in calculating the correlations between between the individual penalty rates, we just say how many penalties did this player take or did they not take the, um, per minute. So one of, the, um, one of the reasons why I wanted to, to dig into this in the way that I did is that a lot of the approaches, you know, I've, I've frequently mentioned Mike Lopez's work and I will again because it's in some sense it's the most important recent work on this, most important work recent or otherwise, the, but his approach is frequently combinatorial, where he looks at, at a lot of, of patterns of this penalty, then this penalty, then this penalty, then this penalty. And one of the things that I wanted to get a hold of is, is if those things were affecting penalty rates, then, then they should also be affecting the rate of calls, including the times when no penalties are called. So I wanted to get a handle on what that spacing was like. So that's why I approached things in terms of rates. Although, as I'll tell you in a moment, I've, I've decided that sort of that I, I, you know, if I decide to publish this more, pursue this more seriously, I'm going to change my approach again. The, the correlations for individual rates to model estimates um, are reasonably positive. You start to see all of those, all of those dots way out to the right there are, are people who have taken, in the most recent season, people who have taken lots and lots of penalties per minute. In fact, I had to truncate the scale. There's two or three people who are, who are out at like, at an X value of like 100 or something, you know, just scandalously high rates. Uh, you know, if you take, if you only play like six shifts and you take one penalty, you're going to look hideous by penalty rates. This is one of the one of the risks of using rates and why, you know, if you want to use rates, you have to do silly things like introduce minute cutoffs. Um, and so, uh, penalized regression is a is a big stick, but it does actually solve this problem really nicely. And so you see all of those all those people tag, 
um, smooshed up against the left hand side there, all at zero, where they where they played however much they played, but they didn't take any penalties, so they all get zero penalties per minute. Uh, but with a zero biased approach, you can smooth them out when you when you smear them a little bit. Um, but you still you still see them underneath zero um, because players who don't play very minutes as a rule uh, tend to play pretty low tempo stuff. The fourth liners frequently are more interested in being safe than they are in in doing anything in particular. And so that leads to a style of play um, where you see fewer shots and you see fewer penalties. The, the correlation here um, is, is about 0.4 or 0.47. It depends on where you set your minute cutoff. If you set it at zero, then the correlation is much, much lower because of those, um, I don't want to say outliers, because of those extreme values that, uh, that I was talking about. Um, so if you set some kind of sensible minute cutoff, you get a correlation of around there. Um, which is which is very clearly positive. You know, there's an obviously an effect there. So some effect of some of the effect of players taking penalties is on their team is that they personally are taking penalties. Um, but only 19% um, of the variation explained, which is the, so that's just squaring R. That's a bit lower than you would expect if the essence of penalty taking is just about individual discipline. So this is. You know, one of the things that I really that I really like about analytics is that I feel like it really embraces the teamness of a team sport. That you, you know, that you can't just look at the you can't just sort of zoom in a camera on a particular guy and say, well, that's his contribution is what I can see when he's in the frame. You know, you you want to to tease apart the way in which the team sport is a team sport. How do the players affect one another? The and and so that that R squared value being as low as it is um, is some vindication I feel for the approach um, of trying to isolate other structural factors that um, that might explain why penalties are taken and drawn in the in the perfusions that they are. Similar, if you look at drawing, <coughs> pardon me. Again, you see the the zero skewed a little bit low. Um, the but broadly broadly much the same. Um, but you might notice that I've labeled the axes um, slightly differently than usual. Up in the corner, the top right corner where it says good, that means you draw a lot of penalties and also you cause your team to draw a lot of penalties. And, and, and especially because there's an obvious causal way to do that, because all of the ones that you draw personally account for your team. You know, that, that's just good all around. But more interesting to me is players who are sneaky good, the ones who are not themselves drawing a great deal of penalties, but their impact on their team drawing penalties is good. And so these are, are players whose contributions are appearing on other players' stat sheets. The, uh, and sorry, just before we go into a couple quick rundowns of some lists of those, um, we're looking at the same, the similar, in fact, slightly stronger correlations um, for drawing, uh, which, uh, which is interesting to me. I, I, I expected that to be slightly weaker than taking, but there you go. Um, so, the, so if we went through the like the good good list, the people who are who are causing their team to draw a great deal of penalties and also drawing a great deal of them themselves, we would be reiterating the lists basically that that we had before. Um, but it's interesting to look at players who who take lots. I put lots in quotation marks there because lots here means not not really that many, but relatively more than you would expect. Um, but still have a team effect that is good on penalties taken. So these are guys who are taking penalties who are causing their team to take fewer penalties. So Sean Couturier looking good there. And so this is one of those, one of those analytics truisms that, that if Sean Couturier doesn't look good one way or another, you've done it all wrong and you have to throw it out and start again. The, um, Ryan Graves has gotten a lot of ink spilled about him because of his extremely good plus minus. Um, and so here's, here's uh, uh, another a thing that he's doing well. Um, which is not showing up immediately in his stats. Um, Brett Connolly, Kevin LeBanc, um, Dmitry Kulikov, Wayne Simmons, mostly forwards. The, the almost entirely, in fact, that section of the graph is almost entirely forwards. And so that, that makes sense where you can have, you know, you, especially if you're gonna be present, you're gonna take a certain quantity of penalties, um, but you can still have a good impact. The, the opposite, players who are sneaky good, who aren't personally drawing a lot of penalties, but are causing their team to, now you get almost entirely defenders and generally ones that are fairly well known to be good. Victor Hedman, Matt Dumba, um, Dylan DeMello, who uh, chronically underrated, um, and Sam Gerard, another, the, uh, another younger player who's um, looking very strong. Um, more interestingly is the sneaky bad players, the ones who aren't taking a lot of penalties, but are causing their teammates to take lots of penalties. So this is 
here you this fits the archetype of um, a lot of offensively minded players, even if they're not all forwards, who for whom you need to have uh, a certain quantity of cover. And so Brent Burns is top of the list by an enormous distance. Um, Ovechkin crops up here again. Um, Domi and Kessel also Darren Helm, for instance, and this um, goes back to what we were talking about before, um, where where being fast is one thing, and and it, you and so that so for Darren Helm in particular, you might you might see a narrative there where where because he's extremely fast, he's not going to take a lot of penalties himself. But if he's not in position, which goes back to something like Burns, who who is unconstrained by notions of position very tightly, the then you. You can you can imagine easily a causal explanation for exactly why that might be the case. Um, I think I'll I'll skip over the sneaky bads. We don't need any uh, any more attention to that. Um, just to mention sort of how I might smooth things over in the future. Um, the first thing is the getting a hold of rates is all well and good. You know that getting out of that combinatorial mindset where you're just looking at well what happened at the what was the last penalty as if the next penalty were a foregone conclusion. You know the the clock might well run out, and of course it's qualitatively different if there's a and quantitatively different if there's a penalty immediately after the previous penalty, or if you have to wait six or seven minutes before you get your next penalty, or if you have to wait twenty or thirty minutes. Uh, and so I think reworking the whole approach as a logistic regression. So instead of targeting what's the rate of penalty taking, target what's the probability that a penalty will happen in this given second, and then you could even model um, you could even model some of the things that. Um, that Ingrid looked into um, the uh, another aspect of, of her work that I didn't mention yet, where she looked at, at details of specific penalty calls, that calls that required more judgment were taken in a different pattern than calls that required less judgment. Uh, and so you might, you know, and of course some penalties are, are purely mechanical, like puck over glass penalties. So you might, you might um, model that behavior explicitly. And if you had something more sophisticated where you were targeting probabilities, you could probably do that. You could look at specific referees by name. Um, I've found that that's a bit of a third rail in terms of public analytics, that if you if you start, you know, writing up Wes McCauley this or Tim Field that, you'll get some people who are very, very uh, uh, heated very quickly. Um, the But I think there's, there's still interesting work to do there. Uh, and then, of course, you could look at specific penalty types um, just as such without looking at, at the interaction of the specific penalty types with the refs. So that's that's all of all of, you know, in some sense, there's a bit of a work in progress where I came up with something that I, that I thought I could do something good with. And, and the, moment you, the moment you do anything worth doing, of course, your, your reward is uh, to do it all again. And uh, so that's what I intend to be doing over the next little while. And so when, uh, when it's done, I'll show you the next version of it. Thanks a lot. Uh, so I think I speak for everyone when I say thank you. Also, I need to alert you because I will not let you know. Um, there is a crown on your head at the moment. The lack of tiara was noted and it was remedied. So I think I technically have the tiara at the moment. Oh, wait, no, no, it's awkwardly in between the two of us. Okay. Oh, you do have a tiny one. <laughs> we, we photoshopped a, a gold one on you in the stream. Um, the question <laughs> from the stream, but uh, was a couple of people have asked uh, about how you think it would look during regular season versus playoffs, particularly with the potential of playoffs uh, being played in empty arenas. What do you think will happen to the home and away effects? So I, I've read some reasonably convincing material that that some of the home team benefit for penalty drawing is specifically related to crowd noise. And, and that the, has always been a bit of a mystery. I don't, I don't know how I would handle it properly, the, especially because my focus has always been on, on the structural aspects of home team advantage, like that the rules are different for face-offs or they were, or that, that this coach gets to make the last change and that coach does not. And so, the, but that said, every time I've looked into those structural things, there's always, even after you try to account for those things mathematically, you still see a residual home team benefit. So, I mean, being purely scientific, it has to come from somewhere. Uh, and so where, where, you know, crowd, crowd support, literal crowd support, I mean, especially thousands of people very close to you that's known to affect human behavior in a number of other ways. So, so I would, I would be interested in having that data. I, I'm a little bit worried that, that too many things may have changed. Most obviously the, the long time off in between having played games and playing games again, uh, that that might get confounded with some other things, but, um, 
but I would still enjoy digging into that. So, well, thank you to everyone who has tuned in for this morning session. If you are attending one of the tutorials that is starting in, at the half past the hour, I have no idea what time that is in North America anymore. I hit 1 a.m. brain. Um, you all have an email. Go to that. If you haven't downloaded the software you need already, please do that. It will just save time in the tutorial. Um, and then everyone else, I believe we are back at 12.50 Eastern time for the midday session.